Alrighty. So, um, my name is Kirk Haynes. Um, I'm here today with all of you guys uh, in order to talk about building an observability observability platform with Crystal. Um, now, a little bit about me, just really briefly. Uh, I've been doing uh, software development or DevOps system administration type of work professionally for um, almost three decades. I think 1991, 1992 was was when I first uh, uh, really dove into to things. So I've been around for quite a while, and I've been doing uh, Ruby as my main thing for um, since the very, very early 2000s. Um, and I really just picked up Crystal in a serious way this year. So all of this um, that I'm going to show you came about as th this was my first real major project that I did with Crystal. Um, and so I'm just going to kick it off here. Yeah. There we go. So when I talk about building an observability platform with Crystal, um, Building is something that is a continuous thing in this case. Um, the platform is called Minion, and it's far from finished. You know, what, we're, what you're seeing is a work in progress that I'm going to walk through here. And um, you know, if, if it looks like something you want to help with, it's fully open sourced. And so I would, I would love it if uh, a few people wanted to come in and give me some PRs and help me out somewhere. So the story of Minion. Um, We'll start with the prologue. Minions and, and observability platform. So what is observability? Uh, on one of New Relic's blog page, uh, pages, they have this definition and it's very textbooky, but basically what it boils down to is that observability is all about taking a bunch of different data streams from myriad uh, uh, servers, myriad containers, whatever you have running out in the world, and pulling it all into one place where you have a system that lets you sift through that data and make sense of complex data so that you can find just what you're looking for, so that you get alerts on what you need, that sort of thing. Um, so it's just a way of simplifying your world when you're managing a lot of symptom systems. Um, so chapter one of my story. In May of this year, I started a new job working for the US branch of Josh Software, which is a consulting firm. Um, they've mostly worked in Ruby and Rails type spaces, but in recent years started moving into more going and, and diversifying a bit. And when I came on with them, um, very first week that I was there, they were running a hackathon where the, the main concept was form a team uh, develop a proof of concept for a product, pitch it, and if the company liked it, they might throw some resources behind it in order to help develop it. Now, when I joined the company, one of my coworkers was somebody that I had worked for previously at Engine Yard, um, and Jay Austin is his name. And when he was working at Engine Yard, he did a lot of professional services and DevOps work. And he always had in his head a vision for a product that he wished he had access to then. And so for the hackathon, he thought maybe we could, could put something together that, that is a proof of concept of this product idea that he had had for years. Um, I just kind of jumped into it and said, hey, I can... Uh, work with React and I can develop a, um, a mock-up of what the product might look like from the web point of view with a fully functional mocked up React product. And so I spent a weekend building it. Um, it was really pretty, but I didn't actually keep that code uh, and I don't have any screenshots of it. So you're just gonna have to take my word for it, but it was a really pretty thing. And the basic concept was pretty simple. Um, there's nothing really groundbreaking with most of this collect logs, collect system telemetry, um, pair that with an uh, easy to use system for sifting through all of that in a centralized way. Um, one of the things that was important to the concept was the ability to remotely execute commands because, um, well, at Engine Yard, we had thousands of customer instances that were running on AWS and our customer support folks would frequently have to connect to these systems in order to debug problems or fix things. And for SOC 2 compliance, we had to have a way to audit every one of those connections. You know, who did it, when they did it, what they did, 
um, we had to have logs of all of that information. And so the thought was, it would be great if we had a platform where we could get all of the important operational data on the systems, we can see all the logs. And if we need to run something, if we need to access the system, we can do that right from inside the platform. And it's all logged, it's all auditable. Um, so it's, it's all a one-stop shop for anything that you might need to do. And apparently the company agreed that my mock-up was pretty and that the story was compelling because they basically said, fantastic, go spend some time building something that's real. And they had one specific use case in mind for that. Um, the company was working with another company developing uh, COVID-19 testing appliances. These were PCs slaved to laboratory equipment that would run rapid tests um, for a relatively low cost. And one of the, the requirements for this is that um, you know, these machines might be sitting in some lab somewhere in some remote, remote part of the world where internet connectivity is spotty. And so they wanted to be able to gather continuous metrics on the operation of the lab testing equipment and the system itself, and also be able to allow technicians who might be somewhere else in the world to connect to these systems, do diagnostics and that sort of thing, but without providing them with full remote shell access and with durability to those network failures. So if data is being streamed to somewhere else, the internet drops down, all of that data that happens while the internet is down isn't just lost. When the internet connection comes back up, the data will continue streaming. And so those were sort of the, the thoughts that we had in mind when we started um, planning this thing. Now, there are a few moving parts to this. There's an agent which runs on a given computer, given software system, and it collects the logs, it collects the telemetry, and it streams it back to a server somewhere. Um, and again, that agent needs to be durable, the network failures, it, they, the, the desire was that it didn't lose data if the network dropped or, or the data loss was very minimal. And that agent is also then responsible for command execution and it needs to have bi-directional communication with that server so that um, from a centralized location, you can manage the agent, you can change configuration options on the agent and that sort of thing, as well as having that agent streaming data the other direction. And likewise, because these things were gonna be installed on lots of different systems, some of which were pretty small, the agent itself, it was desirable for it to have a small footprint and that it'd be easy to install. So, the stream server, which is what we call the, the server that accepts all the, the data streams from the agents, its constraints were, were looser. Um, it needed to be able to talk to a lot of agents in an efficient way, and it needed to have efficient data handling so that we can send the messages to Elasticsearch or proxy it somewhere else or stick it in a Postgres database, um, whatever made sense for the given situation and the given client. And then the, the other major sort of moving part of this was an API server, which would act as glue between whatever UI components we had, whether it was a web UI or CLIs and all of the data in the background. And then of course, there's the web UI itself, um, just the, the platform, it's the most visible part, but it's really just the window into everything that's running underneath. And so as coincidence would have it, back in 2007, I wrote a product called Analogger. It was an asynchronous logger. Um, the, the basic implementation is that you had a client library that would send logging messages to a central server. And um, it, was, it was a one-way communication. It would fire those logs out and it would just you know, assume that they arrived at the destination and something reasonable happened with them. And the key thing with Analogger is that it's very stable and very, very fast. Even in 2007 rubies, it was very fast. It can handle a phenomenal amount of concurrent connections and messages per second. And when I was thinking about it, I thought, you know, the core of what I wrote all those years ago really is pretty similar to what we were trying to do with, with Minion. So I thought maybe that could be repurposed. Now, for 
the agent, Ruby has some drawbacks, you know, thinking about repurposing. Ruby has some drawbacks for an agent. And two of the big ones are that the deployment story isn't great for Ruby. Um, because, and it's, it's not a Ruby thing, it's an interpreted language thing. But because it's an interpreted language, there's a lot of baggage that has to come along with any executable software that you're installing under Ruby. Um, there's been a variety of different attempts over the years at solutions to this problem, but it's really still a problem. And also Ruby is really not the first language you think of when you're trying to write something that needs to have a small memory footprint. Um, it's possible there are techniques you can use in order to limit Ruby's memory usage, but Ruby tends to, to not be the smallest memory consumer on your system. Um, your Ruby programs often use quite a bit of memory. So for the stream server, on the other hand, Ruby seemed fine. Those constraints that I mentioned weren't a big deal for the stream server. And um, my history with Analogger um, over the last 13 years, it has handled billions of messages. Um, it's completely stable. It, it just, it never fails. Um, and so I, I was pretty confident that if I use that as sort of the, the base to start implementing the, the Minion stream server, things would be okay. Now to tie this all back to Crystal though, in 2015 uh, at Ruby Kaigi, I first learned about Crystal. There was, there was a talk at Ruby Kaigi introducing Crystal to all of the attendees. And I played with it some then, but my impression of it back then was that it was kind of immature and I was working on other things and just didn't really have the time for it. So I put it on a shelf and didn't really think about it for five years. Um, but then this April, I went back and I looked at Crystal again and I was really impressed at what had happened in the intervening five years. Um, I started taking programs that I had written in Crystal and I started trans or written in Ruby and I started translating them to Crystal. And um, the, all of the lovely Ruby ergonomics for the programmer that I really liked are still there in Crystal, but Crystal is blazingly fast as far as its execution speed. And while I was skeptical of that I would like the typing, I actually discovered that I really did like it because it helped me um, make less buggy code. You know, frequently by the time the program compiled, just unless I made a logic mistake, the program worked. And I really love that. And then there's the strong deployment story for Crystal just because it is a compiled language. And so I just thought, okay, let's take Analogger and let's translate it from Ruby to Crystal and let's start there. And um, since this was a Greenfield project, there was nobody telling me I couldn't. So that's what I did. And Austin volunteered to write the agent. And because he was learning Go and Go ticked a lot of the same boxes as far as execution speed and RAM usage and things like that, um, he went ahead and started implementing the agent in Go. Now, fast forward a little bit of time, and I had a working stream server written in Crystal. Um, the agent had lagged behind, however, it turned out that, that implementing it from scratch in Go just kind of got bogged down. And I had had to write an agent already in Crystal um, a, a skeleton of one in order to test the stream server. And so we decided, let's just use that. And we went forward with that. So now we had two of the components of this platform, both implemented in Crystal. And if we fast forward to today, um, the agent currently, when it's compiled on a 64-bit Linux system, it's about three and a half megabytes in size. So it's pretty small. And if you really are concerned about distributing a small binary, um, that binary can be stripped down to a few hundred K trivially. Um, when it's running, it runs at about 10 megabytes in size. This little image here that I have on my slide, I pulled off of one of my digital open ocean droplets last night and it's showing um, digital ocean has an agent that, that you can run on your droplets that collects system performance metrics and streams it back into digital oceans um, house built observability platform and it's written in Go. And so you can see over here on the right, um, the Minion agent is just under 10 megabytes in size and the DigitalOcean Go agent's about 12 and they're streaming basically the same data. 
So it's, it's right in the ballpark. It's, it's pretty comparable to what other agents seem to be running. Um, and one of the key features that, that was needed, the durability to um, network failures um, still exists in the agent. If the network connection drops or the stream server dies or whatever, that agent will accumulate all of the data that it was going to send up to a limit. Um, so you don't run your disk out of space or whatever. And when the network connection comes back up, it'll go ahead and stream it all out. It's a nice little feature. The stream server itself is about seven megabytes unstripped and it's very fast. Um, I thought about trying to put in some specific benchmarks into this talk, but it's actually hard to re get really good quality benchmarks on something like this. Um, benchmarking it just on my laptop with a local database, um, everything local, uh, it will push about 60,000 messages a second on my laptop actually into a Postgres database. The main limitation there is how fast it can push it into Postgres and not the stream server itself. Um, if I'm streaming to like Dev Null or something, uh, that 60,000 goes up to several hundred thousand a second. So then the third piece of this whole thing was the API server. And the API server originally was written in Rails. We had a developer that was loaned to us. He was between two projects and he was a Rails developer. So we had him spike out the first version of the API server. And it was a very well done Rails API server. But once he went off onto his next project and I came in and started working on the web UI and had to work with the API server, I was frustrated. And this isn't a knock on Rails. Um, it's just that the API server felt very heavy for what it was. I mean, it was a very simple API and it used, yeah, about 200 megabytes of RAM before it was really doing much. So it just felt heavy. And I thought, since everything else is implemented in Crystal, why not just implement this in Crystal too? And so I went and I just surveyed what existed at the time, which was a few months ago, um, for uh, Crystal web frameworks. And this list is actually a current one. Some of these things weren't on this list a few, a few months ago. Um, but when I was surveying the list, I kind of uh, settled fairly quickly on Athena. Now the author for Athena is very active in the Crystal Gitter and he was talking about Athena frequently. And so I went and I checked it out and I just really liked what I saw. It has fantastic documentation. Um, if you're looking for a simple web framework in Crystal, go check out Athena's documentation. Uh, it's fantastic. Athena is really easy to understand and it's easy to use and it's more than fast enough. It was perfect for writing APIs. And this was, I think, the very first controller, a snippet of the very first controller that I wrote with Athena. And I just threw it in here because while this isn't a very code heavy talk, um, I kind of just wanted to show you what it looks like. Um, Athena uses annotations in order to convey meaning to the various um, methods in, in a controller. And it's a nice pattern. It's very concise, yet very clear. And one other dis design decision that I made with the API server is that I didn't use an ORM. Um, there are some good ORMs for Crystal, but in this case, uh, a lot of the queries that the API server has to do aren't super simple queries. They're highly optimized queries. And um, so I felt like I would be bypassing the ORM a lot anyway in order to issue these optimized queries. Um, so I, it, the API server doesn't use any crystal ORMs. It's just straight database interactions. But I did keep the Rails migrations from the Rails project. I stripped out everything from the Rails project except for the minimum that was necessary to run migrations. Because while there is at least one migration implementation for crystal, um, we already had a whole bunch of migrations. And I just didn't want to deal with trying to rewrite those for a different platform when I could just strip everything Railsy out and leave just the migrations. So 
I'm going to see if I can give you all a live demo of what this thing looks like really quickly. Um, so this is just sort of a generic landing page for the product. Um, and it's got just a very, I'm gonna go in through the admin login. Um, but it's got just a very simple, um, simple layout, very familiar. And the fun with live coding is that there seems to be, oh, there we go. Maybe my internet connection was just a little bit slow. All right. Um, so this is this is the administrative side to the to the whole platform, and it's basically just a CRUD interface for managing some administrative stuff. There's not much interesting that's here. The interesting stuff is over here in the user dashboard. And this is actual live data that's coming from a selection of live servers that are out in the world right now, um, as well as my laptop. This Kirk Dell XPS 15. I've got the agent running on my laptop, collecting uh, statistics. And so we can just go and we can grab a few of these. Um, I don't know, let's see. You and you and you and you. And we have a few different actions we can take. Settings is all about managing the agent. Um, and commands is the remote command execution part. Now, unfortunately, I have the remote command execution part kind of broken right now, so I'm not gonna show you that. Um, we'll focus on just the logs and the telemetry to let you get a, an idea of the flavor for this thing. So it's pretty simple. Um, you come in, you've got a bunch of different parameters you can use to define how you're gonna search for logs. And um, we'll do this, we'll search for basically login attempts to these servers. And this is all live data. And um, it's implemented with a polling period that where the, the pause is dynamically defined by uh, an analysis of recent logs and how frequently logs are coming in. And so you can just go in and you can look and you can see what's going on and you can monitor your, monitor your off logs or you can add to it and you can monitor your sys logs as well. And you can slice and dice this data in various ways. So you can say, um, we're gonna search just for invalid logins and um, there must not be anything in this log data that has invalid logins. So it gives you that notification. And that's basically how all of the logging, slicing and dicing works. Um, it's very simple, but it's super flexible. Now, you can also look at telemetry for these various systems. And I'll just use the same set that I selected. Um, and you can say, okay, I want to look at system load average. And there you go. And then let's add to that um, memory usage and free RAM. And there's the data and you can say, okay, I want to see what, what's happening on my laptop and we can go pull the data from my laptop as well. And there we go. Now these big swoops here are because there were long periods of time where I wasn't running the agent on my laptop. And this is pulling a selection of data points from the entire history. So, you know, if I want to say, hey, only after a specific date, and we'll go in and we'll just say, pull the data from my laptop since yesterday. There, there's my laptop's random usage since yesterday. Um, and that in a nutshell is what the, uh, the user interface for this thing looks like right now. Um, and so I will switch back to my presentation to just kind of wrap it up here. So there were a few things that I learned while doing this project. This was the first piece of really serious crystal code that I wrote. Um, and I came to it having like you know, 19 years of Ruby experience. 
And so one of the things that I found is that if you know some Ruby, you can come up to speed on Crystal very, very quickly because there's an enormous amount of Crystal that um, is the same as Ruby. Uh, there's a lot of Ruby code that will just run unaltered on Crystal. One of the things I've been doing for Advent of Code is I've been trying to write wherever possible solutions that run in both Ruby and Crystal just for fun, as an example. Um, it's not always possible, but um, it's possible more often than you would think. However, Crystal isn't Ruby. There are very fundamental key differences. The typing, getting a handle on how typing works is a big shift. And as a matter of fact, most of the real serious frustrations I had with this project were because I was butting my head against um, properly understanding how the typing worked in Crystal. And once I worked through some of those problems and settled into it better, um, those problems disappeared. Uh, I also want to note that I haven't had any problems with this project at all that are Crystal language problems. Um, this is all running on 0 0.35.1 and it's rock solid, stable, um, no issues at all with the development or the operation of this thing. Um, now the same can't be said for a lot of the community libraries that are out there. There are a lot of immature or abandoned libraries and really that's no different than Ruby. It's just that Crystal is much younger and so the total volume of mature libraries is smaller. So when you go hunting for something to solve a particular problem, you're a lot more likely to find something that half solves it or solved it three years ago, but doesn't compile now or things like that. So when you're hunting around in the Ruby or in the Crystal ecosystem for libraries, um, you have to do a little bit more due diligence on what you find. And a quick example of that, there's a shard for Crystal called Crystalline that has a, it, it's a collection of container um, container classes for Crystal. And I wanted a splay tree implementation for Minion because I find it useful in some cases to use it as the basis of a cache. Um, I won't go into that because I'm running out of time, but uh, Crystalline has a splay tree in it, but it's broken. It just doesn't work the way it should work. Um, and it's incomplete. So I took that code and I reworked it and I revamped it and I expanded it. And so now there is a splay tree implementation that pretty much duct types to a crystal hash um, with just a few minor exceptions. You can, you, you can drop it in and place to the hash and it should just work. Um, but I had to go build that myself because there just wasn't something available that I could just pick up and use. So what's next for Minion? There's, some notable gaps in the things that are finished that are part of the overall uh, project map. It needs remote command execution handling, and it needs the, the management portion for managing the agents for within the UI completed. Um, notifications also have been completely ignored to this point, but it's part of the, the original sort of thought process and design is that the platform should be able to proactively notify you when there are certain problems. And there's a whole bunch of small bugs in, and also just enhancements that are needed. And over time, I've just tried to put issues into the GitHub repos as I come up, come across these things so that I can come back and fix them later. But if somebody else wants to come and help fix them, that would be awesome. Um, and then the other thing that is really needed is some client libraries so that um, whether you have a Crystal program or a Ruby program or JavaScript or whatever, um, they can log directly into the system and they can send metrics directly into the system. And with that, I will stop blathering and see if anybody has any questions. Hey, Kirk, thanks. Uh, this, this was uh, really, really instructive. Uh, there's, a, there's a question on CICD that I think you can take because uh, they're running a bit late on track two, and then we okay. can maybe you can take the other couple of questions offline. And yep, that'll work just fine. I can I can take them offline. So actually, let me see. Let me pop up the QA window because I lost it. Um, so, oh, what's the deployment pipeline look like for Minion? Um, so 
are you, are you, I assume you're talking about um, like from, from the, the stream server because it looks a little bit different from an agent versus the stream server. Um, the design intention for the agents is that they um, should be self upgrading. Um, that is something that is half implemented. Um, and, and the control for that will come from the remote management of the agents function in the UI so that you can go and you can take a look and you can say, oh, these agents are running an old version. Let's tell them to upgrade themselves and they'll just upgrade themselves. For the stream server itself, um, it's, it's a very just standard um, deployment infrastructure. Um, there's uh, the, the tests are, um, I haven't written a lot of tests, let's put it that way, except for in certain areas. So like there's some common libraries that have a lot of tests written around them and stuff like that. But the actual deployment for, for Minion is um, really just a, a delivery mechanism that pushes the, the new repo out, compiles it, and then I have a um, systemd service that restarts it. Um, it's pretty simple. <laughs> 